Hi, this is Jacob Hornberger with Sheldon Richmond. This is The Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the libertarian angle on the burning issues of the day. Hey, Sheldon, um, you know, there's a great documentary that's getting wave reviews on the drug war. It's called The House We Live In, and it's directed by Eugene Jarecki, who also did um, the, the uh, documentary why we fight about the military industrial complex and this one's about the drug war it's getting rave reviews and all of a sudden i noticed that this thing is going to be shown on pbs tonight um people have to check their their local stations but i think it's 10 o'clock eastern time i forget the exact title of the uh of the segment but i think it's at 10 o'clock at night and uh, i think this is a fantastic opportunity for people to see the horrors of the drug war on television. I mean, this is not something we're going to ordinarily see in the mainstream press, which, of course, is a big promoter of the drug war. They love the drug war, despite, you know, 30, 40 years of failure. And all of a sudden here on PBS, you've got this fantastic, uh, according to the reviewers, uh, documentary about the drug war. What do you think? Well, I can't wait to see it myself. I didn't know much about it. Uh, I did uh, read a, qu a quick uh, write-up about it, and uh, my uh, DVR will be set to uh, capture it this evening. I'm very eager to see it. Uh, it's true. It's interesting that it's going to be on PBS. You'd think uh, you know, the commercial stations would have uh, investigative reporters out there exposing the drug war for what it is, but uh, some, for some reason they are too busy with other things. I don't know, you know, what's going on with Lindsay Lohan or, or, or somebody to, co to cover something as uh, minor as the drug war, which fills the jails and helps uh, make the U.S. the uh, the biggest jailer, in, you know, in the world right now. Uh, so uh, this this could be, uh, you know, I'm not going to predict any kind of breakthrough because how many people, you know, watch PBS documentaries? Unfortunately, not enough. But but if we could promote it and get people uh, to watch it, it'll at least uh, make us better, even better, at arguing our point that the drug war is just uh, absolutely crazy and uh, terribly harmful, and uh, has you know does no good whatsoever. It's not even a matter of netting out the good and bad. It does no good whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's surprising that the mainstream media would never uh, publish something like this. That, that they've got the standard status mindset uh, you know, of the U.S. national security state, the Pentagon, the DEA, the CIA, the whole thing about how the drug war is necessary for national security and and so forth. I mean, you know, I can't think of a of of a better area where we libertarians differ from the from the status than the drug war. Uh, I mean, he, here is a I, – I don't think you can come up with a better violation of the principles of liberty. I mean, imagine jailing somebody, fining somebody, punishing somebody for choosing to ingest something that the state has not approved of. I, mean, I just can't think of anything that, that constitutes a, a greater violation of the principles of liberty as that. And, and, I mean, to me, it's a moral argument. I mean, why shouldn't people be free to ingest whatever they want, whether it's harmful, dangerous, or whatever, without the state punishing them? And, of course, on top of that, you have the utter destructiveness of the ruined lives, uh, the, the racism behind it, uh, where you, where you, you know, they, they incarcerate disproportionately blacks and Latinos. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's 60,000 people dead in Mexico from the drug war. I mean, so you've got the utilitarian argument, but to me, the most powerful argument is they've got no business putting people in jail for ingesting what they don't approve of. Yeah, and I think we need to point out that you know when uh, when the government prohibits something like that, it doesn't go away. So prohibition, in a sense, is a euphemism. It, it doesn't mean that the, uh, the the good in question is bought and sold or manufactured. It's it's, it's a way of uh, it's sort of a distracting way of saying, in effect, the government has given a monopoly to the least uh, you know uh, 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 desirable types in society. In other words, the black market will tend to attract thuggish types because most people uh, you know feel they shouldn't get involved in, in black markets uh, uh, you know for one thing it's illegal but there's also the sense that you know polite people don't do that so what does it do it leaves the drug trade to the to the worst types uh, the most unsavory types so that's really what prohibition is it's as if the government gave a license to the the, the thugs of the, of the society and said here you can buy sell and manufacture drugs 
uh, you know, no one, no one, uh, no one else is uh, allowed to do this. Uh, we'll make sure there's no competition from, uh, you know, from people who typically do business on the up and up, you know, out in the open, honestly. Uh, and so when you describe it that way, it seems to me we could convince people that um, this drug war is not a very good idea. It's not even a drug war. It's a war on people. The drug, even drug war is a, is a way to distract attention from what's really going on. This is a war on people. Drugs don't get thrown into prison, although drugs manage to get into prison. Uh, people get thrown into prison. People's lives are ruined. So uh, it's... There's nothing you can say for it that's positive. Uh, it, it induces the worst things, uh, police state tactics by the police, militarization of the police, uh, propaganda and lying by the state. I mean, they make the, uh, you know, they want us to think that uh, anything they've declared illegal is, is uh, dangerous, uh, implying that the things they haven't made illegal aren't, you know, necessarily terribly dangerous. And yet, as Jacob Sullen shows so beautifully in his book, uh, saying yes, uh, People use all kinds of drugs every day responsibly, the way they also use scotch and, uh, you know, vodka and gin. Uh, but you don't hear about those people because they're obviously keeping out of sight because it's illegal. So what you hear about are the people who wreck their lives, and so people get the feeling that drugs only means records of lives and that there's a, a responsible use of, of these substances is impossible. But just like so responsible use of alcohol is possible, Responsible use of these other things is, is possible, and Solomon shows it. Yeah, I, I think your point about the drug lords and the drug cartels is a great one. I mean, it, it's the drug war itself that has produced these kind of people because uh, that's what a black market does. It attracts the unsavory types that are not going to engage in this enterprise. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that with all these drug busts that they make, you know, and I, I've heard this thing for 40 years about how they're busting the Medellin cartel and how they've arrested this guy and how they've made a record drug bust. What a, a lot of people don't realize is that the more people they bust, the more people come into it to replace them. And really, the only way to get rid of the drug lords and the drug cartels is through legalization. I mean, we saw this in Prohibition. Where as soon as they ended up ending, uh, they they end up uh, terminating prohibition. They get rid of the Al Capones and all the alcohol gangs and so forth. And that's exactly what would happen with with legalization of drugs. All these people would go out of business immediately because they could not compete against the uh, the well established pharmacies and drug pharmaceutical companies that would be selling this thing. And I think another aspect of this is the rehabilitation aspect. The right now drug addicts. They're not encouraged to get rehabilitation because if they if they are open about their addiction, some narc's going to turn them in, and and and, and they're going to start getting followed and busted and sent to the penitentiary. While in a system of drug legalization, the addict he can come out openly, talk about his addiction, seek help for it without worrying about going to jail. Well, that's true. True, the the law enforcement uh, uh, system will. Uh Often put people into uh, into these clinics as an alternative to prison, but you still have to go through the system and and possibly have something on your record. Uh, these clinics, on the other hand, would not be in favor of getting rid of the drug war because it's a huge source of their of their clientele. Uh, a lot of people don't forget who uh, use drugs. Uh, while other people think they may have a problem, they themselves don't think they have a problem, and therefore don't wouldn't voluntarily go into any kind of clinic. And so the state uh, does force a whole bunch of them uh, into it on the grounds that, uh, well, not, given that they, because they give them a very narrow choice, it's either that or prison. And given those circumstances, a lot of people will choose the clinic uh, rather than the prison. Uh, we have to remember that before 1917, uh, these substances were not illegal, and you know there wasn't there wasn't this huge problem with every everybody being stoned all the time and nothing getting done. Uh, people again, you know, use these things uh, uh, intelligently most often. There's always going to be some small percentage of, uh, of a population where, you know, where, uh, consisting of individuals who, uh, you know, don't have much ambition in life and, and uh, are very short-sighted uh, and short-term acting. And so they, they, you know, they mess themselves up on some sort of substance, uh, alcohol, uh, as common as, uh, as, as anything else, more common. So uh, you, it's a pipe dream to think that that can be eradicated from society, even if you could do it in a, in a perfectly uh, uh, legitimate way, which you can't, uh, you're not going to change that. There's always going to be some small percentage. It's probably a fairly constant percentage 
uh, through time. Most people have things they want to do with their lives. That's why when a lot of the Vietnam veterans came back who had been using uh, heroin in the jungles just to uh, you know dull the pain and the fear, uh, the government had set up a huge number of rehabilitation centers, thinking we're going to need to uh, you know treat all these vets. And almost nobody showed up because well, most of the vets, once they got back, just stopped. They just stopped using heroin because the life had now changed. They were out of fear, out of the jungle, back toward their, uh, you know, back in their normal life, and they just stopped using heroin, which you, you know you weren't supposed to be able to do under the state's propaganda. You're hooked for life, and unless there's some this tremendous intervention, you know, you're a slave for forever. It t- turned out it didn't work that way. Once people actually had their lives back, they stopped using drugs. Yeah, and, and that point about there's so many people dependent on the drug war itself, I mean, it's almost like an addiction where you've got police departments that are dependent on these asset forfeiture laws, and, and, and let's not ignore the corruption. I mean, there's got to be a lot of people that are on the take, uh, letting drug dealers go through, looking the other way, licenses. I mean, it, the whole system gets corrupted. Uh, you've got jobs that are dependent on this thing, and I mean, there's no real redeeming value to this war and so that's why i wanted to bring this thing up about this show tonight uh, it's it's uh going to be on pbs at 10 uh eastern time it's a fantastic documentary uh i know we carried a op-ed by brad pitt the uh, the other day in our fff daily um uh, proclaiming how great this movie is. In fact, I think he's serving on the board of trustees or something of the people that put it together. It's an absolutely great documentary, according to the reviewers. So I recommend everybody watch it. Um, the House We Live In uh, on PBS Tonight at 10. Uh, Sheldon, another thing, though, I, I mean, this is almost defies credulity. Uh, did you see in the paper where President Obama is now encouraging uh, loans to be made to uh, bad risk borrowers in order for them to buy a home. I mean, th- did I really read this? Is this bizarre or what? Yeah, you might have thought you p- you just picked up a story from um, some, several years ago, except it said Obama. So that would be a clue that it couldn't be several years old. It couldn't be from the 90s or the early 2000s. But that's true. Uh, Obama... Uh, there's a story in the papers uh, last week about Obama uh, push, wanting to push the banks to make uh, mortgage loans to people with weak credit. The administration claims that uh, the, such people are being left behind as uh, housing values are uh, you know, coming back from the crash, uh, and these people are being left behind. And, the, and the, he reminded the banks that there are plenty of taxpayer-guaranteed mortgages that, that could be uh, you know, made for people, extended to people. And so, what's keeping them from uh, from the uh, from uh, lending money to weak uh, credit people? After all, the taxpayers stand behind them. Nobody really has weak credit if the taxpayers stand behind you. And uh, he's presenting this as if it's some novel idea that's never been uh, studied or tried before. And yet, all you need to do is read uh, some history of the of the Great Recession, and you'll know what a big role such thing plays. Subprime mortgages, Fannie and Freddie guaranteeing subprimes, and the Federal Housing Administration, the Community Reinvestment Act, which originally came in the 70s, but then was beefed up in the 90s, which told banks that if you don't um, lend to, to, uh, to the poor areas where you have branches, you know, be careful anytime you ask uh, for anything, like uh, to open a new branch or to merge with another bank, we're going to check your record. And if you don't have lots of loans to, to, weak, uh, to people with weak credit, you, you know, you're not going to get any kind of consideration. You're going to basically get punished. And so they did that, and then you had the, you know, the, uh, the uh, subprime and, uh, and, and other forms of uh, non-standard mortgages co- uh, to accommodate people with bad credit or no credit history whatsoever. Uh, and that helped to drive up uh, prices. That helped to create the bubble. That plus cheap uh, um, uh, money and low interest rates uh, from the Fed. That, that inflated the bubble, which then eventually burst. And the administration's strategy ever since has been to reinflate the bubble. They just don't understand uh, what is what, what went wrong. They think there was nothing wrong with the bubble. The, what the problem to them was that the bubble burst. But the bubble itself was good, in their view, because that's everything they've been, they've been doing, the administration and the Fed, has been designed to reinflate the bubble. And, uh, and instead of letting housing find its true, its true value in terms of consumer preferences, uh, they're trying to pump Pump it up, and uh, 
it's hard to believe. Like you said, you had you, you couldn't believe what you're reading because come on, I mean, it hasn't been that long. How memory seems to get shorter and shorter all the time. Well, I think part of the problem is is that they, they they always blame these kind of things on free enterprise or the free market or deregulation or the banks. I mean, notice how they're they're going after all the banks for you know defrauding their customers and so forth. They cannot conceive of the possibility that if their beloved little welfare state system and managed economy system and interventionist system that is the root of the problem here. And so they go off and say, well, it must be the banker's fault or the fault of free enterprise. Now we need to do this again with better people running the system, better people managing the system. When all they're doing, like you say, is doing the exact same thing that they were before. And, you know, that's why it's so great, you know, that the libertarians are around to, to show people, not in the mainstream media, because, I mean, that's why we have this show, to present the libertarian angle, to show people that there's cause and effect here. This is, this is interventionism as a philosophy, a managed economy as a philosophy. Uh, the idea that government should be guaranteeing people's loans and helping people buy houses or other property, that that's the root of the problem here. And um, but that's not something they can see, Sheldon. They have a blind spot when it comes to their little interventionism and their little system here. Well, they really have sort of a pre—I won't even call it a pre-modern mentality because they understood this in the Middle Ages. It's really a—it's a primitive mentality that uh, there are, really are no such thing as more forces. We can do whatever we will. It's our will that stands in the way, and there are no market forces, no regularities. No uh, chains of cause and effect that operate, whether or not we recognize them, or whether or not or whether or not we like them. That's that's the attitude that I can do this. If I, we want to do this if we get together and you know unite, and, and then uh, you know there's no law of supply and demand. There's there's no uh, market forces that uh, that uh, um, d- d- tell us that uh, interest rates uh, uh, perform their job correctly when they're allowed to find their their level. And they don't, and they don't perform uh, the, that job when the government interferes and distorts them or holds them uh, artificially low. Uh, it's as if those things really don't exist. If we believe hard enough, if we just believe hard enough, we can overcome anything. Well, it's just like believing that the you know the law of gravity really need not uh, uh, stop us from doing what we want if we just believe hard enough. It's it's a child's uh, mentality. Except I don't mean to, I don't want to insult children, but there's something very childlike about it. If we just wish hard enough. We can do it. And, and if it's not working, that's because you people out there aren't wishing hard enough. So get with it. <laughs> it's really a very destructive attitude. Well, and I find it fascinating when, when President Obama says, well, there's a lot of young people that are struggling. They can't buy a house. Well, why are they struggling? Why, why are they having such a difficult time economically? It doesn't even... You know, occur to him that it's because of the massive taxation, inflation, debt that is hanging over the, uh, people, all the money that's taken out of their paychecks to fund the welfare state and the warfare state. I mean, that's the reason why people are having a hard time, you know, getting started in life. You've got this massive burden of taxation, regulation, militarization that the welfare state's producing, the warfare state's producing. People are having a hard time getting started. In life, getting jobs, getting well-paid jobs. A lot of them are still living with their with their parents into their thirties, and the real root cause of this, as we libertarians know, is their welfare warfare state, which is mounting up the taxes, the debt, the inflation, the the whole shebang that that deprives people of a reasonable standard of living. All right, and, and if, look, if you want to look at housing in particular. Uh, Obama and, and everyone else in government should look at all the different ways that governments at different levels uh, increase the cost of housing and therefore makes it harder for uh, uh, lower income people or younger people to get, to get a house. Uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, every, every area has zoning with minimum density regulations, which means you have to have bigger lots than maybe people uh, uh, would be willing to buy. And so therefore the houses are, you know, houses are on bigger lots. More exp- and bigger houses, so they're more expensive, which prices uh, lots of people out of the market. There's all kinds of ways government makes it more expensive to get into housing uh, that uh, you know than if they would just let things alone. There'd be uh, uh, there's no reason why there wouldn't be more affordable housing 
in the absence of uh, all these efforts by government. Plus, government stimulates demand, which, of course, uh, raises prices. So uh, this idea that we have to make it possible for young people to buy houses is, is just really uh, a phony claim because of, of all the ways government uh, makes it more expensive to buy a house uh, to begin with. And, and like you say, on the other side, uh, it's, uh, this has been a fairly jobless recovery. Half a million people last month left the, left the job market uh, giving up. So job participation rate uh, is, uh, is at an all-time low, or at least is a, a, the lowest it's been since the Carter years in the 70s. Um, you know, the private economy is not producing many jobs, and uh, this is getting worse and worse with each recession. Uh, the, the job comeback is more slow, and uh, they are, their only answer is, uh, well, the, the government needs to spend more then. The government needs to spend more. And, uh, you know, there was an op-ed recently by somebody at, uh, what is it, Bard College saying, uh, uh, well, enough of all this talk about the deficit. The deficit's too small. We need to be spending more, have more deficits. <laughs> yeah. uh, and this is, you know, this is sort of the Krugman, uh, the, the Krugman pr- uh, prescription. Uh, if, we, if we don't have full employment, I guess the government hasn't engaged in enough deficit spending. That's their, that's their uh, uh, mantra, really. You know, that, that's their whole world outlook. Uh, what we need is for the government to, to drastically cut spending, leave that money, and cut taxes, leave that money in the hands of uh, pri- you know private individuals, and, and then the government needs to get out of the way. Don't try to regulate the uh, interest rates. Get the get the Fed out, uh, and then the, the the economy can recover on a f- sound and sustainable footing. Something that really reflects consumer preferences, not some phony recovery that won't be sustainable. Because it's just a matter, you know, it's just government injecting uh, money here and there as a way to make things look good, you know, in time for the next election, basically. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely amazed that there, that the status are now still calling for increased government spending. I mean, with with all the destruction that the government has done economically, and these people are calling for more of the poison to to take effect. Uh, it's absolutely incredible the, the, the way their minds work, that if the government just takes more money out of the private sector and hires more people, that that's the key to prosperity. I mean, that's really the debate between on economics between libertarians and statists. Um, I mean, they're, they're really ideal, Sheldon, to me, is, is Cuba or North Korea, where you've got the government employing everybody. You know, there's no unemployment there. I mean, you just 100% employment. Of course, everybody's starving to death. But that's the mindset of the statist here, where they say that we want the government to be hiring more and more and more people, which, of course, entails taking more and more money out of the private sector, running more businesses into the ground, sending more businesses into bankruptcy and causing more unemployment that they then say, oh, well, they could be employed by the government. You know, and, and this is this is where the, the battle lines are drawn, Sheldon. I mean, we're, we libertarians are battling for an entirely different paradigm where we want to lay off the public sector so that people in the private sector can keep their wealth and where the, the public sector now becomes productive citizens instead of citizens that are just draining the private sector. Yeah, that's right. And they wouldn't say that uh, the other side wouldn't say that the government actually has to hire uh, the unemployed, but they, but they, uh, you know, would want government to uh, uh, have more contracts, let's say, with private companies, which would then, in their view, prompt the companies to hire more people. So it, w- it wouldn't have to be direct government hiring, but it is government spending, which they argue will then lead to this multiplier, right, uh, for, uh, for every dollar. The government spends, there's going to be more than a dollar of economic activity because a contractor hires people, and then those people who are newly hired, this is the theory, go out and buy stuff. And so the stores that are selling the stuff then say, hey, we better bring on some more retail workers, and, you know, there you get your rippling effect. Uh, that's the theory. But, of course, as Bostiat reminds us in his story about the broken window, they have to withdraw the money first to even do this initial spending. And that would have been spent by the uh, the private holders of that money, the people that earn the money, they would have invested it. They would have been buying either buying things for consumption or saving, which which means it would be available for uh, investment by companies. And when companies invest, of course, that's a form of spending too, because they they're either buying products, producers type products, you know, capital goods, or they're hiring people. And so those newly hired people are going out and spending. So. Um, 
it's the broken window where you don't see what's not being produced because government has uh, commandeered the resources. The other thing is the government uh, can't be counted on to spend it well because nothing it does is, uh, sub- is submitted to the market test. We don't know. Politicians uh, will spend on what does them the most good. You know, hey, put the money into my district. Why? Is there a need there? Well, I'll say there's a need there, but what I need is really I need to show jobs so I'll get reelected. That's the that's how government makes decisions. It's not investment. It's actually form, a form of consumption. You get real investment when it's put to the market test, which means an entrepreneur knows, knows he goes out of business if he's guessed wrong and has put the resources to some uh, use uh, to the wrong use in terms of what consumers want. So government is, an, is is not a substitute for the private investment process. It's a, it's a it's a it's a fake. Really, it's a fake. Yeah, and I think the state is one of their blind spots is they never ask. How wealth is created? They just think wealth is a given, and 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 they see the wealth in the private sector, and they say, oh, what can we do uh, with that wealth? If we just confiscate it, we can have these projects and these projects and that pro- those projects. But you know, the real question is, is what the one Adam Smith asked: What is it that makes a nation wealthy? What is it that produces higher standards of living? And that, of course, is what we libertarians have said, well, since the time of Adam Smith, is that that the key to that is private accumulation of capital that makes people more productive, and that productivity results in higher real income, which then can be paid in higher real wages. And that the more the government takes out of that private sector, either through direct taxation or indirect taxation with inflation, the more it's lowering people's standard of living. That's exactly why the Cubans and North Koreans are on the verge of starvation. Hey, but Chuck, well, I think we have... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I think, unfortunately, we have to blame one of the followers of Adam Smith, namely John Stuart Mill. He really turned uh, political economy in a bad direction when he declared in his uh, famous book that the problem of uh, production had been solved. He saw production as basically a physical matter. That's been solved, he said. Now the only problem left is, is the problem of distribution. So he separated production from distribution, which was a very bad turn. In, in classical and and then it carried over into neoclassical eco, uh, economics. I mean, Austrians have it right, but a lot of people don't know about Austrian economics, and they follow that line that says, "Look, we just have to worry about uh, just distribution. Production takes care of itself." Not realizing how you distribute goods by the, if the government, the way the government distributes goods will affect production. Most people don't get that part of it. Hey, before we wrap up, I wanted to bring up something about the North Korean um, crisis over there. That I noticed there was a paragraph in a New York Times article that was really revealing about what's going on. Uh, there's that park, of course, where North Korea has blocked uh, cooperation, international cooperation between the South Koreans and the North Koreans with this crisis. And the paragraph says in the Times says, it was not the first time that North Korea had disrupted the park's operation. It blocked cross-border traffic three times in 2009, once for three days, out of anger over joint military drills by South Korean and American troops. Now, if that happened in 2009, just three or four years ago, what would motivate the Pentagon to have joint military exercises again? I mean, they had to know that the reaction would be exactly the same. And when you put on on top of that the sanctions, the latest round of sanctions, which inevitably will tip some people into death by starvation in North Korea, because we all know that there's lots of people dying from starvation because of their socialist system. How could they not know that this would provoke a gigantic response from North Korea? What is it with these people, Sheldon? Well, they could. There's no way that they didn't know, and uh, you know they do these various kinds of maneuvers and, and war games with the South uh, on a fairly regular basis. And then recently, they uh, they've sent some very powerful bombers, uh, you know, in the direct, up to the border at least of North Korea, uh, that are cap- that capable of uh, carrying, uh, you know, the the mother of all bombs, that big monster bomb that they I don't know what it is, thirty thousand, I forget how many pounds of this uh, that they uh, they invented. Uh, and uh, obviously they could also carry nuclear weapons. They do keep poking this uh, hornet's nest, and then they wonder why, uh, the, you know, the dictator on the other side, who I have nothing nice to say about, uh, says, you know, if you attack us, we're going to attack you, and then that's considered threatening. You know, if you attack me, I'm going to attack you back, and then that's considered a threat, the, the threat to retaliate. 
which is not exactly the same kind of threat as the initial threat which looks like uh, aggressive, looks very aggressive against the North. So I think this is one of these bogus crises uh, that they'll, uh, you know, milk uh, and get as much out of as they can. Uh, we should not have, what is it, 29,000 troops, uh, uh, you know, near the line between North and South Korea, which is a tripwire. If, if, if South Korea uh, stumbles into war with North Korea, the U.S. is automatically involved. There's no choice in the matter. We we can't get out of it at that point. We shouldn't have troops there. We shouldn't have any kind of guarantee to the South Koreans. And, um, you know, this is this is going to happen. This is just going to keep happening because it's in somebody's interest uh, for it to happen. Yeah, it's, it's just the, the Cold War a mindset and, and a Cold War that expired many, many years ago. And uh, all it does is, a, you know, it's a, it's a civil war between North and South, and the U.S. has absolutely no role in this at all. And you're right, they got the troops there to serve as sacrificial uh, sacrifices to guarantee U.S. entry into a war without congressional debate, a national debate. And if something gets out of control here in China gets Gets into this thing. I mean, we're looking at a at something much bigger than I think anybody even can anticipate, including conscription of young men and women to go and die for nothing, as they did in, in the 1950s and then later in the 1960s in Vietnam. Um, of course, that's not the type of thing you're going to get on the mainstream media, huh, Sheldon? No, afraid not. Okay, Sheldon, that's the show. Uh, thank you all very much for tuning in. This is uh, Jacob Hornberger and Sheldon Richmond with the Future Freedom Foundation, and this is The Libertarian Angle.